model is currently um, where you selected your vendors and then when you get a job rec, they send their resumes to the one contract and then they get it to the managers. And basically, you know, sometimes they'll get back to us and let us know if they want to move forward. Is that the model you're going to continue to go? I guess it's kind of managed services. Is that how it is? Yeah, let me try to get into that a little bit mm -hmm. deep, deeper because we have basically two areas of staffing. Actually, three. Uh, one is from a, a labor standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, say, for example, labor for all different types of skills and trades that you would see out in our generating station, all the way to our transmission distribution group. Uh, we have our IT staff, which covers a full gamut. This is all different, totally different skill set. There's mainly focused on the IT side, software development, and so forth. Then we have our, our professional staffing everything from clerical to accounts. Uh, let's just talk about the clerical and accounts area. Uh, in that area, we have a host of companies that are out there that bid for the work. And that, those contracts are coming up for renewal. So these are our prime, what we call a tier one group. So in purchasing, if we have a specification that we send out a, a job, that we send out, we need a buyer, for example. This goes down to HR. HR basically will send this out to the different staffing departments. And this is, we're talking contracts now, contract employment. They'll send this out to the different staffing firms. They'll give us their uh, host of resumes. Those resumes come up through, uh, through purchasing. Well, sorry, actually, they go through HR first. They'll make a first cut. We're only interested as a user area in a prime group because that reduces our cycle time for interviewing and so forth. We take all the people, comp companies that, uh, like yourself, the staff that you provide us, we actually interview those guys. We test them internally. We, we ask for test scores from your company, and we'll evaluate them just as we evaluate a new employee here. Uh, once that decision is made, your company is invisible at that point. We're only looking at the people. So we'll make a selection. We'll work through HR. Now, the model moving forward is we want to make sure that there's feedback so you know whether your candidates are selected or not. That's maybe a process improvement that you were talking about. But, uh, it's a long process, but we try to uh, basically create a competitive field. But our interests, keep in mind what our interests are. We're looking at for the best candidates. That's our interest. We're not so much looking at the companies that are out there providing candidates. We're just looking at the candidates themselves. So maybe some guidance for you is when a specification comes across your desk, we're looking for the best candidates. And this, in the IT staffing world, in the, the labor world, we're looking for the best candidates, most experienced, as most companies. And you find that that's consistent with most, most, most companies out there. A couple questions. Um, and it's the first one I think is pretty easy one. When you put out uh, something for a bid, um, let's say it's, um, like uh, paper products or something like that. Is it just like in paper or you don't combine it with paper and soap or something like that? Is it just a, a bid that would be just in the paper sector? Well, let that's, me that's, give you some examples along those lines. Uh, we just uh, entered into a relationship with Staples just recently. As you will, Staples is a very large company. They, they provide a host of different services and product for office supplies. Uh, we moved from one company to Staples. Uh, we're looking at the pricing, we're looking at their, the services that they have to offer. We're looking at a lot of value-added discounts that they can provide our employees. So we're looking at that whole picture. But again, what's best for OUC and uh, the customers that we serve. If we have an opportunity where, uh, say for example, where we're buying uh, valves, for example, we can go two ways. We can buy from the distributor who reps a lot of different manufacturers, or we can do business with the OEM, the manufacturer mm -hmm. themselves, or we can do business with a smaller business that doesn't have the same line, but offers the same product. So in the part of uh, our diversity spin, that's where the buyers are trained to make the differentiation. We still have to provide the end product to our internal customers. But who we buy from, that decision is made by at the buyer level. So, go ahead. 
Okay, my next question then is, um, I guess it's in diversity. For your bids that go out, um, do you have any participation goals for MWBE companies? No, we don't have a specific goal. Say, for example, uh, 10%, 5%. Right. We don't have that type of goal. But we want to be proactive. And that's our, our mission is to be proactive and competitive. So we try to go the extra mile to make sure that companies that may not be competitive because of lack of information become competitive. That means we'll take the time to say, okay, let's understand what your pricing is based on this RMP. We invite you to come in to public information request. You basically will make a request to see what the bids have been in the past. Compare that to where your pricing is so you know ahead of time whether you're competitive or not based on the lines and the products that, that we buy. Mm -hmm. And we feel that that's been a successful model to guarantee some success for, for your firm. Yes, sir. Um, do you see a future for small business, local business participation in those bigger projects, man? It's good to, when, when, when you're equal, you can meet those parameters that you were stating earlier. Um, you can get the advantage of looking at the history and so on. But bigger projects that pretty much excludes a lot of small businesses and local businesses to participate. Is there a form that you see or an ability to allow some partnerships to be able to participate in those projects that are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, say, for example, in the construction arena, okay, we'll have more projects, smaller construction projects than we will large, large projects. One of the mistakes I see most companies make that want to start doing business with, they want to go straight for it and bid on the larger projects, which have the, the large bond requirements, insurance requirements. Some companies can handle that. Great. But most can't. So it's best to get the relationship looking at the smaller So you say, well, what type of that? We have a lot of uh, foundation work. We build substations throughout the city. Uh, we do repairs. We have uh, repairs at our gates. We have repairs on building repairs. We have heating, HVAC uh, repairs, door repairs, closure repairs. That type of work, although small, is repetitive. We put up film on windows, we do blinds, we do carpet, uh, painting. Uh, although small, we have a lot of it. So because it's maintenance, maintenance and repair. Those, sometimes those contracts, you just pick up a phone, we have a blanket contract for painting, we have a blanket contract for carpet, blanket contract for janitorial, for landscaping, uh, mowing. Those are prime opportunities for couple smaller companies to get inroads uh, in with OUC. So I'd encourage you to look at the medium to small type of opportunities. Uh, and therefore, the insurance and bidding requirements are not as uh, prohibitive at that point. But yes, yeah, there is some opportunities for smaller companies. But you have to be aggressive. I mean, you can't sit back and expect for us to call you. When we put the RRPs out, we put RPs out to known companies. You do have an opportunity to bid if you know about the bid. And the key is you got to have that relationship to even know about the bids out there. Bridget. That's why it's important for you to complete your vendor information form that you all should have. Because not only when you register at the OUC.com site, is you go into the vendor database, but I'm also building a database with vendors that I've met personally, and I'll call you, follow up with you. Um, get some references from you so that I'll have a list that's ready to go for the buyers when there's an opportunity to come along. So don't wait until you see an opportunity or hear about an opportunity. Be proactive and start now. So complete the form, return it to me, and that'll help me help you. So two questions. Uh, first, the, the field buyer is not necessarily the end user. No, they are the end user. Bill buyer, again, works in the business unit. So they could be the inspector on the job. They could be the project manager on the job. They just agree to take on the role as a field buyer. So say, for example, on a construction project, say we were doing a foundation for a transmission tower. That field buyer, even though they're limited to only a $5,000 order, so what does that mean? That means that they, you could typically buy materials, he could buy uh, 
a small service, whatever the case may be, to support that project. He, he makes those decisions on the job site. He picks up the phone, he calls whoever he knows, and he makes those decisions. But he is still the project manager or the inspector on that job site. And he, he works for the business unit. He doesn't work for supply chain. And that's the difference between a field buyer and a corporate buyer. Corporate buyers are located, or I should say they work in supply chain. They may work in the business unit, but they work for supply chain. And they deal with all the larger projects. Okay. The second question is that in the corporate buyer, uh, that information is public too. Is uh, is more orders about under the 1500, uh, under the 5000? Well, that information you should be working with your corporate buyer because that requires a report. So if you say in your specific area, you want to understand, well, how much business do you, does OUC do in your specific area based on a commodity code or based on a service? Work with your buyer. The buyer can put together a report depending on your relationship. Again, you keep in mind these buyers, they're not sitting around. They have tasks to do every day. So depending on your relationship, we can generate that information for you. The previous slide, you had a list of, I guess, qualifications or uh, maybe some type of criteria. Yeah. Can you kind of elaborate on maybe levels of those qualifications for each one of those items? Okay. Like, like bonding, insurance, or even capacity. I mean, what does that mean to you guys? Okay. I'll just start from the bottom work my way up. So on the capacity, that's your ability to uh, complete the job. Say, for example, if you're a trenching contractor, all right? So we're burying underground cable, service cable to your residence, all right? So we're, we're buried primarily 36 inches deep. So what I mean by capacity means do you have a trencher that can bury, has a blade on it that can put that cable down, uh, can open a trench, I should say, 36 inches deep so we can put our cable communications in the in the trench. That doesn't mean go out, can you can go out and rent a, a trencher that can only put down uh, trench 18 inches. That's what we mean by capacity. You have the right equipment to uh, deliver the project. So with that, how do you, are, are you just quantifying that by some type of questionnaire prior to releasing? There'll be a requirement of uh, equipment, you know, require you to list your equipment. Okay. We just use the trenching trenching contract as an example. Right. We ask you to list your equipment. We know if you have a cat or if you have a, a, a say another manufacturer case or another uh, manufacturer that model number, we know if that's if it has the ability to put the cable in. That's what we mean by capacity. Or if we look for a crew size, uh, for example, if you're doing mowing for us, Mowing means a lot of different things to us. We have basically three types of, we have clearing. It's still mowing, but it's clearing. It's clearing for transmission, or we have clearing for distribution, which is something else. And then we have mowing, as you would have mowing around a commercial building or in a park. When we ask for equipment list capacity, we'll know about how big you are, where they can handle it or not. What about the bonding? Okay, on the bonding, as you're aware, uh, bonding depends on the job size. So we, we have a lot of creative ways how we handle bonding. Uh, we try not to, if we know that you're not going to be competitive on a particular bid, make sure you get that bond back so you're not tied to waiting on OUC to make a decision. You can move on to another project so you, you can still post bonds elsewhere. But uh, it all depends on the project size. That's why I like for new companies, to get that relationship built for smaller jobs. The ease of getting bonds on, and then keep in mind, uh, bonding is not required on every project. In a smaller project, there may not be a bond required at all. That's why I like these smaller projects. You get that relationship built, you get that reliability, and our uh, superintendents and foremen give you a call, get on the job site, replace the ballast, put a new foundation in, and you get it done overnight, get it done the next day, they understand they can depend on you. There's no bond for that. It's a small dollar, you know, five to ten thousand dollars for work. We won't even bond it. When you start getting up to twenty-five thousand dollars or more, it's going to be. We're going to ask for more. That's why I was kind of wondering what's your threshold for right twenty-five thousand. Right, and then on insurance, 
uh, in order to set foot on OEC property, we do have minimum insurance requirements. Uh, at best, it's going to be a million, you know, mostly it's about two million. How about on no bid um, kinds of business? Is insurance still going to be required? Uh, that depends on the project. Uh, if, you, if you're doing work on OEC property, there is going to be an insurance requirement. There is a, a issue. Okay. Right. Do you have that um, anywhere on your website where it tells you about that? Yes, you contact your buyer to okay. you get that information to you. Because on any RFP, it's spelled out in the RFP. Yes, sir. So, Brother Archie, this is a two part question. If I understood you correctly, there really is no um, minority women on business, goal, target, etc. But yet you have a diversity coordinator. Is the role relationship uh, to the vendor and the diversity coordinator to help them facilitate doing business as a minority or woman on business? Bridge is right here. She's uh, <laughs> available to you. She intercedes. Our buyers, let me kind of lay the landscape here. All the buyers are briefed on, on our policy. We actually have a policy that focuses on diversity. Uh, we have a procedure that focuses on diversity. All the buyers are required to know that and follow that. On top of that, we have Bridget. As, as our buyers are, are busy, we ask Bridget, we have an RFP or a bid going out. We contact Bridget and say, hey, we've got an RFP. Are there, do you have anybody? Have you met anybody? Ah, Bridget. <laughs> and then at that point, Bridget facilitates to give us a name or give us a company. It depends on what we're doing. Excellent. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, since we don't have goals or preferences, my um, philosophy is to work with all of the organizations that would um, have affiliations with the women and minority groups that we're trying to recruit um, for business with OUC. So I'll be working closely with all of those organizations when um, I receive information that we're looking for companies to do a specific job. I have contacts in each um, organization that I send this out so that they can send it to their um, client base and get back with me so we can ensure that there's a diverse group of vendors on a bidder's list. Excellent. Second part of the question is, um, Jericho, for example, has the capability of taking uh, an event like this and uh, through expanded capacity building can put this event uh, live on the internet and embed this event into uh, to other media sites. Sure. Uh, African American Chamber sites, your site, uh, Aquarius 7 Broadcasting, our site, so that you can get expanded reach and range in communications of the things that you do. But I don't know from looking at this list who would be the contact person that we interact with to try to establish a communication buying relationship. Who would that be? The marketing group. We have a marketing group. Marketing is listed on it. Should be able to get in time contact, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, Ken Cross. Look under Ken Cross, you should see marketing down there, unless I'm mistaken. Well, no. 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 Uh -huh. no. I'm going to call Brady. Brady's communication system. Customer connection. Yeah, but it's, it's like systems and whatnot. I mean, it's, it doesn't seem like it's advertising, public relations, marketing, promotion, or any of the things that come yeah. under that umbrella. Right. right. That would, just so you know, that would be Ken Cross. Okay. So Ken Cross is your point of contact. It's really hard for me. Ken Cross is your point of contact. So what does that mean? That means like for production activity, which we do a lot of, um, promotional items, which we do a lot of, things from t-shirts to handouts to giveaways, um, there's opportunity there. So you say, well, how do you get that opportunity? Uh, again, first point of contact, as I mentioned before, is Ken Cross. They can be aware of who you are. But you have Bridget to intercede as well. Bridget deals with projects. Uh, there's projects that we do in marketing, outreach, uh, green activities, uh, shows, events. We participate in those. That requires marketing support, production support, people that can do business with uh, the media. That flows through Ken Cross and through a marketing group. But how you get that business, I just gave you the mechanics. And as you're well aware, it's all about relationships. And 
what success you've had in the past, what events you've done in the past, what media uh, capabilities that you've got. It all is about relationships and getting to know. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's constantly interacting with Bridget, uh, with Ken Cross, putting you in contact with our key marketing people, which we do have managers and directors and a VP in that area that mm -hmm. you need to know. Yes. In your business, those are people that you need to be tight with. And it takes time to get to that, that level. Good questions. Outside of posting um, the bids and things on your website, is there any other avenue that you use to post that uh, information? Uh, like newspapers, any of that? Yes. Thing? Okay. Say, for example, we've got uh, civil engineers here. We have a civil engineering related type project, say a major, uh, say a land landfill expansion. Uh, we've got a, where we've got, we need to hire a professional engineer, any type of professional service. We follow a CCNA process, which is state law. Mm -hmm. So that requires to, to advertise publicly, meaning to advertise in the newspaper. So occasionally you will see us advertising the newspaper for those type of uh, projects. They're wrong. Um, I suppose you know what Smart Grid is, right? Yes, I do. Is OUC planning to do Smart Grid? Yes, sir, we are. Does everybody know what Smart Grid is? No. Yeah. Can you explain or do you want me to? Or? Well, I'll, I'll do my version and I'll let you <laughs> get to more detail. What we're doing with OUC as far as Smart Grid is concerned, Smart Grid basically is uh, working, say for example, uh, there are meters out there that transmit and communicate your activity at home. Uh, in order for us to balance our load, to reduce our loads, we don't have to build a new power plant. Uh, there's transmission devices that uh, talk to each other, they talk to distribution. It's all electronically, which talks to the meter. There's all types of products that are offered now as part of the smart grid effort. So all you see is embarking on this effort, doing business with, right now, the big players out there, you know, the Siemens, the GEs, IBMs and on and on that are entering into that smart grid market, but there's a lot of components that need to be purchased that small businesses can play a role in. Uh, but again, it's all about building relationships, getting to know the internal players regarding smart grid within OUC. And that's my version. So. Yeah, and in a nutshell, if, if what they're going to do is have intelligent appliances, like your dryer, mm -hmm. and it'll tell you that if you want to use this dryer at this time, that if you use it at this time, if it's peak time, it's going to cost you a lot more kilowatt per hour. So you may not want to use it. That prevents these guys from building substations and substations to keep up with the demand. So, but the reason I ask is because um, you know they have to build an infrastructure, which is all telecommunications and things like that. So it's telecommunications and changing equipment. I, I talked about the meters. So it requires a different meter to be placed on your home, business, or facility. So it's. Uh, Huge, huge endeavor that's been uh, talked about for the last uh, five, ten years. It's now come to fruition and starting to uh, get a lot of government support uh, to develop smart grid projects. And probably the quickest way to learn about it, just Google smart grid. Mm -hmm. There'll be tons of documents pop up. So. Right. That's the same thing for renewable. We're talking about solar uh, and all other types of renewable energy. There's a lot of opportunity in that area. Uh, depends on your business and the services that you uh, and products that you have to offer. It's a lot of opportunity. Yes, sir. One of my client companies is in the atmospheric water generation business. It's uh, air to water technology. They pull water out of the air and they can do anywhere from small office units of five to eight gallons a day to 25,000 gallons a day with their larger Triton units. I is there any consideration being given? to atmosphere water generation in your company, and would that be something that you all would do directly, or would might you connect with vendors who have expertise in that area? I'm not aware of any projects along that lines. Obviously, we're pulling our water out of we have deep wells and so forth, but uh, I'm not familiar with that technology. It, but bottom line is, you've got a buyer on your list, I believe her name is Sue Grasson, who generates our water group mm -hmm. that can put you in contact with uh, one of our engineers that might want to sit down and hear about it. So what does that mean? An opportunity. opportunity. Absolutely. All right. Great questions.
Anyone else have any other questions for us? If not, it's been a pleasure sharing some time with you, the African American Chamber of Commerce. Again, we want to invite you to visit our website, talk to our buyers, and hopefully we can uh, do some business down the road. Is Bridget going to talk about her group? Mm -hmm. <laughs> about my group? Yeah, about you and what you do and how you do it, how we reach you. And what I'm doing here? All of that. <laughs> She's right there. <laughs> no, but basically what I've done, I've um, spent 14 years in the state of Florida's Office of Supplier Diversity doing state MBE certification, outreach, advocacy, and working with the state agencies. So, and when the state went away from price preference, um, and back in 1999 with One Florida, we had to think of a new way to ensure participation would still be in place. And one thing was putting more emphasis on those persons that are responsible for buying, being more aggressive in our recruiting and matchmaking, which means uh, pairing the smaller companies with larger companies that have that take the majority of the monies that we have with the company. Um, so what I've been doing since I've been here is I've visited um, four um, key associations, which is the African American Chamber, the Hispanic American Chamber, the Asian American Chamber, and NABO, the National Association of Women Business Owners here in this area, that I can establish contacts with, that I can work with them on doing different outreach activities to make sure that when the buyer says that I have this project that's going out, do you have any companies, any diverse companies that can provide the service, that I have a database, a resource to go to where I can, I know I can get at least five from the four that I named in addition to that so they can be given the opportunity. So the key thing is education and empowerment through education because um, the price preference was good, the goal was good, but still businesses weren't getting as much as they could have been doing. So when we got rid of the goals, there was a significant increase because people saw that they had to do more than just that goal. A lot of um, buyers, not saying with OEC, but we see that we have a 20% goal. Well, okay, um, this is the third month of the fiscal year. I've reached that 20% goal, so I don't have to worry about, you know, the MWBE part anymore. I can just do what I normally do. So um, just giving more of an opportunity for businesses to have a chance that have never done business with you before. That's why it's important to build relationships, and so it's important for you to follow up as well. What I normally do after these events, I'll contact you via email first uh, just to do a little bit more background um, research on your company so I can put you on the ready to go list for the buyers to use. So following up and participating, when you have an opportunity to do one-on-one -on -one sessions with different groups, um, government, city, state, do that because what we're about it with the diversity at program at OUC is not making sure you just do business with OUC, but just making sure that you're a viable business because if you're doing business with the city of Orlando, Orange County, and we call each other, we work together as a group, um, my colleagues, then it, that's helping your business. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that you're around and not take a job that's going to put you under. Mm -hmm. And Bridget and Ronald, um, I attended one of these sessions in another city. I think Willie might know about it, but. Um, same thing, it was great, but then when you go back and start making the phone calls, those buyers don't call back, they don't email back. So if you can send a message out to them to at least contact us back or you know communicate with us to be open about it, we definitely appreciate it because I've had just like a stone wall on some other companies that they do this and then you get out there and they're too busy to call you back. And yeah, let me talk about that a minute because you know, this is not new to me at all. I've been doing this for 30 years. But my point is, is that I keep saying this about relationship. Building. So, okay, let's talk about relationship. If I just meet you, and not talk about it anywhere else, but meet you in public, and I shake your hand the first time and we're passing, I'm not going to remember you. But if you're truly interested in a relationship with me, then we're constantly talking with each other on a regular basis. Short, but we are talking. And, but we're not talking about well, what, what can you do for me. We're talking about like goals. So again, what, what are our goals at all you see? Obviously, we either have projects, we've got bids. What can you do for me? This is what I can do for you. 
What I can do for you is give you an opportunity to participate. What you can do for us is, is obviously provide the service in the time that we want it done at the cost that's competitive. It's all about that relationship. Once that you get past that hurdle, you perform, that relationship is such. But you're not even given the opportunity to cross that hurdle because they don't call you back, they don't respond to emails. You can't find the right person that'll get that person in contact. You got the right person the list right in front of you. Oh, that's my point. The we have the list. The beauty of uh, OEC is the fact that we're a public environment. So you don't have to even rely on this. You rely on your own business savvy. Know that RFP's out there. You don't even have to involve yourself with this. You just make sure you're competitive and you compete. And there is an equal playing field out there because we're in this public environment. It's required. It's not an option for us. It's required. And that's the beauty of this. So you got two channels. You got rigid, you got the buyers, and if that doesn't happen, you got me back there. So you're in a good good position, but again, you've got to get that relationship, get that relationship started. I think that's the key. The key is because I, I've, I've experienced those same kind of barriers, and you, know, you go to a nice seminar, and it all seems very, very nice and very warm and fuzzy. And then when you do the follow up, you know, you can't get through, your people don't return your calls, don't respond to your emails. And so if there's not a champion uh, that you can go to that uh, really, really is committed to the process and someone that you can call and say, listen, you know, I've called this buyer, you know, three or four times and, you know, certainly I don't want to be put in a situation where the buyer yeah, is going to be going to be hostile because I went over their head or around them, but I need some help getting through. And there's somebody that can do that, can act, that can can be that interface. I think that that may be yeah. that that's, may be the answer. That's all we ask is a champion that if I can't get a response back, can I call one of you guys and say, here I have a legitimate business that I think you're interested in. And, you know, if it turns out not to be something you need, that's a different story. But at least let me know that. Yeah, right. we used to call it the equal opportunity to compete. Right. Right, and that's what it is because, and if. Getting back with you, I'll follow up and you may find out further research. I'll give you an answer. It may be something that's not coming up for the next four years. That's fine, yeah. But I you can, need to know that so that. you don't, you know, continually. Right. Because right. it takes a lot of my time to follow up, follow up, follow up, and I can't afford a small company like that mm -hmm. to spend that kind of time and effort when I got paying customers I got to deal with, you know. Day to day business. Yeah. We understand that clearly. Yeah, that. Keep in mind, most of our business units have like a five year plan, and we're actively involved with that five year plan. So, in the smart grid arena, if we know that RFP is coming out and you've got a relationship with, with Bridget and the particular buyer, you just you need to know who you are. At that point, you can get that phone call. You're doing day to day activity, paying bills, taxes, and on and on getting that call saying, hey, this RFP is coming up, or it just shows up because you've already done all the due diligence up front. But again, you got to get to that point. Uh, one phone call, two phone calls is not going to do it because you got competitors all over the place looking for that. But I do like that term, a champion. Mm -hmm. That's the key word. Right. I, I've, even, excuse me, I've even done it. I mean, I've been a lot, a lot more aggressive. I've been procuring for a long, a long time in janitorial, and now I'm doing it in, uh, in facility maintenance and different things like that with staffing. I've sent thank you cards to to actual buyers, and they wouldn't get my email, they wouldn't get the number, they, I mean, they wouldn't get my calls, but they got the thank you card and said, hey, you know, you have to be creative in different different ways to, to approach you. Remember, you're trying to get business from somebody that, that has a million or a thousand people, other people that they can give that business to. So I think just being aggressive all the time, just stay at it, don't give up. Let me continue with that. Uh, do you need to put in the other way? I don't know how many emails that you will see per day. Um, it's very difficult to remember each people who so he made an initial band. And today we are here about 50. When do you make relation, do you build relation with the buyer the buyer said, no, I know this guy. Let me see if it's possible to receive response back. But it's just one time. It's very difficult. I am in this for more than three years. And it's, it's, you don't build relations, you don't receive any feedback about your 
your information. Yeah. And this gentleman right here is a perfect example. The office I used to work with, um, State of Florida, Office of Supply Diversity, the Matchmaker Conference, when we did our um, awards at the uh, annual conference, they were looking for uh, a diverse vendor to do awards. And <coughs> traveling and doing different networking activities, you see this guy everywhere. <laughs> I mean, so uh, you see him everywhere. And I say, oh yeah, I have this guy. I, mean, this I see it It's possible to make <laughs> one contact, I stay one and a half year. But I, I go back and go yeah, back and right. see the person. But it's very difficult. Is do you have a unique product? Mm -hmm. It's possible he call you in the first email. Mm -hmm. But he worked with, a, I don't know, in what project do you receive a hundred email yeah. for just one project? And it's very difficult. I know, let me, I remember that guy, uh, uh, the video. That's, that's a key recipe for success right there. Yeah. Persistence. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody understands persistent pays. If you're persistent, no matter what it is, eventually it's going to pay off for you. It's not easy. It's just like Orange County or DOT. You have to stay after if you want to do it. Yeah. And make just one phone call and then because nobody calls you back. I remember, and this is, I just, this is great for everybody, I, uh, when I was working with a janitorial company, and they had just started their business, mm -hmm. and we had to do all the bondings, all the insurance, did everything, and we submitted to a major company. It took nine months to get our first contract. And the contract that we got was junk. It was like really just bottom feed. But we did that, we did that, con we did that one job, and then they seen how good we did it. We did it like it was a million dollar job. And when we did that, they just kept on building and building. That's By the time you know it, they overloaded us. And that's, you know, it was really, really good, so. Another great example. I'll say something um, to the gentleman. One of the things that you can do, because we are such a technology-laden society right now, one of the things that does happen, I think someone may have mentioned it, um, I heard something similar. What we tend to tell people, if you've sent three emails and have not gotten a response from someone, as well as phone calls, do something that you, you're, you know, nothing gets you. You're old enough to remember, like I am. You know, write a handwritten letter. Oh, they looked at their mail because the problem is what a lot of people don't understand about technology is that a lot of times, if they don't have you in their database or their or their address book, it goes directly to spam, so they never see you. Mm -hmm. And that is something that people don't know that happens so many times. And they they could be thinking, you know, I remember somebody from an event but they haven't been able to see your name and get you in front of them. So that's one of the things we talk about. Talk about that tomorrow, too, so you guys. <laughs> What's tomorrow? You said here, right? Flyers up there. She's got one. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. give this to you, but I still need to go to the web page and fill out that. Right, so you're, yeah. right. Okay. That's, that's your, your particular list that you're keying in. Right. right, those would be the people that I've made contact with personally and have done mm -hmm. further research on. Mm -hmm. Thank you.